Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. As per usual, big thank you to everybody that watched last week's episode of the show, liked, commented, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it certainly had quite a number of, uh, of views and uh, it's actually the, I don't know, the, 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 the most watched episode um, within the first week of posting. Um, I don't know over what time frame YouTube has measured that, but uh, either way, um, you know, all, all those views is very, very much appreciated. Uh, also, if you haven't actually subscribed to the channel as yet, uh, I, it would be really appreciated if you did. Um, and so you get notifications of new episodes. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's going to be a new episode every week uh, unless um, the world ends or um, something else crops up. Um, anyway, so yes, Lefroig, obviously very popular. Now, when I was uh, digging around for the samples of, of Lefroig, I also dug out a number of independent bottlings of Bamor. Um, and basically because I realised that I've, I've never done an independent bottling uh, Bamor episode of the show ever. Uh, I think I've only ever done one episode of the show on Bamor, and that was on uh, three releases of the uh, the, the, the ten-year-old Tempest. And I mean, that's going back some years. Um, and I thought, you know, why not? It actually ties in quite well with Lefroy, not only because it's obviously another Isla distillery, but because, like Lefroy, ten years ago, bottlings, independent bottlings of Bamor were, you know, uh, fairly regular, shall we say, just like independent bottlings of Lefroig. and But obviously over the last 10 years, do you see a bottle? I actually see more, probably more independent bottlings of Lefroig now than Bamor. I mean, that, that it's practically a, a unicorn now, if you spot one. Um, and um, Which is a shame, um, because, you know, if you go back to, you know, 20 odd years ago, certainly when I first started in the whiskey industry. Um, I remember, remember vividly my first tasting of Bamor. I mean, it was kind of wild, sooty, windswept. It was the sort of whiskey that really put hairs on your chest. And um, I, I loved it. Thought it was just absolutely incredible. And the trouble is, over the years, you know, it's changed. I mean, I know people go on and on about things being better back in the day. And of course, obviously, the use of the term better is very subjective. Um, and, you know, whiskies do change over, over the course of time, um, sometimes by design, sometimes not. And um, Bamor has certainly changed over the years. It's no longer, I would say, as wild and woolly as it used to be. It's a lot I don't really want to use the word safer, but it's certainly um, more polished. That's a good word. Certainly the 18 is very polished. A lot more oak than I ever remember um, Bamor used, used, used to show. Um, and although, and it's, it's kind of, it's you know, like Scapa, for example. I mean, you know, old school Scapa, you know, Scapa bottled back in the, what, sort of 80s, 90s, you know, wonderfully windswept maritime. Nowadays, it's a completely different animal. Now, um, of course, you know, you can argue whether it's better than it was before or not, as the case may be. And like I said, the use of the term better is very subjective. Um, but I must admit that I preferred the more 20 odd years ago to the Bamor that, that the distillery bottles these days. Um, just a, a personal thing. Uh, maybe it's because it had such an impact upon me when I first started in the whiskey industry um, that it doesn't have the same impact now. Is it me? Is, is it I've become, a, a, you know, um, what's the word, a, a lot more critical, you know, a less open to sort of like what a whiskey is, is showing me? Um, or is it really the fact that Bamor has indeed become a little softer, a little safer, a little bit less hairy chested, shall we say. Um, who knows, maybe it's a combination of the two, I don't honestly know. Maybe you can you, you can sort of tell me whether you think that, um, if you you know if, if you know Bamor fairly well, whether you, you agree with me on the fact that uh, it has maybe got a bit safer over the years. But anyway, um, so I thought it was going to just be a really fun episode of the show to sort of dig some stuff out of the vaults uh, from... Pfft, practically donkeys years ago and uh, yeah, I have stuck my nose in all of these samples and they have survived the passage of time um, and another interesting thing about sort of independence and bottlings of Bamor and like independent bottlings of Lefroy is that both distilleries seem to be quite happy to sell off um, ex-bourbon cask uh, matured spirit 
didn't seem to sell off quite so much in the way of sherry cast matured spirit maybe you know obviously a little bit more expensive they maybe didn't use so much of it wanted to hang on to it um so you know like Lafroig, you know there was always quite a large amount of um, ex bourbon cast bottlings of, of, of Bamore knocking about on the independence list, and I remember stocking stocking them and selling them uh, on, on a regular basis. Anyway, of course, before we go any further, any comments, uh, of course, I do make in today's episode of the show wholly my own and have no bearing or relevance to the company it employs me, just in case. Anyway, I think that's enough waffle. Let's have a look at today's lineup. This is my chance. I'll take it. I'm going all the way through right to right, the top. So, first bottling uh, we're going to start with uh, today is a James MacArthur Fine Malt Selection 10 year old. Uh, bottled at 45%. It's a single bourbon cask, number 20090. Uh, distilled in 2000, bottled in 2010. Now, um, for those of you that may remember the James MacArthur bottlings, most of them were at cast strength, uh, but they did have this uh, occasional bottlings in what in this fine malt selection range. I think a lot of them ended up as uh, in miniatures, um, and certainly I think this was bottled in both uh, uh, 5 CL miniatures and 70 CL so uh, but I so I don't know which it came from obviously it came in this <laughs> lovely sort of uh, green and, and you know I always used to get them in this uh, the wonderful green medicinal bottles um, so um, yeah anyway uh, bottling number two is um, as you can probably just about make out from the color the <laughs> the lone sherry matured uh, Bamore now, and I did kind of wonder what to where to stick the sherry uh, no rude comments, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> uh, do I put it towards the end, but then I've got some older bottlings at the end, and I thought, I'm just going to do it in kind of age statement order. So it mm, it seems a little, probably a little bit out of place to do the sherry uh, as a second one. So this is a Murray McDavid Mission Gold uh, sample. Uh, remember those bottlings in the gold tin? Uh, so this is a 14-year-old Bamore. Uh, aged in refill sherry, dis distilled in 1994, bottled in 2009 at 54%. And I think, sort of going back in time, that's possibly the oldest of the samples uh, that I have uh, in front of me today. Uh, bottling number three, back to the American oak. So this is a refill bourbon hoggy, uh, Douglas Lang Old Particular Bamore. Uh, it's 16 years old. Uh, reference DL 10488, distilled in June of 1998 and bottled in September of 2014 at 48.4%. Uh, next bottle is a uh, AD Rattray or Dua Rattray as they were probably called at the time. Individual cask bottling, uh, 17 year old, uh, distilled in February of 1990, bottled in June of 2007. It was a single bourbon cask, 261, and bottled at 54.1%. The second of the two AD Rattray bottlings is a little bit older. This is a 20-year-old, again, individual cask bottling. Uh, Bourbon cask 272, distilled in 1990 and uh, bottled in 2010, making it 20 years of age at 50.2%. And the last bottling, um, as you can see from the scribble on the, the label, was actually a bottle, a sample that I tasted uh, for the whiskey magazine when I used to do their uh, regular new releases uh, tastings. Uh, so this is a Douglas Lang Extra Old Particular Bamore. It's 25 years old. Uh, a refill bourbon hoggy, code DL10581, distilled in November of 89, bottled in December of 2014 at 55.1, and it was expensive then, and I guess if you want to try and find it at an auction site, I think, what, what's some whiskey base listing at? Something like about 600 quid or something like that? Ooh, yeah. Um, but I... I don't know. I can't remember if I actually purchased um, this particular bottling for the shop, but I've certainly had um, uh, extra old particular Bamores in the past and of this sort of age. And uh, yeah, so I'm quite looking forward to uh, finishing with that one. So, so yeah, that's today's lineup. Hopefully, you're going to find it really interesting. I, I realise that you can't actually taste along with this because if well, if you find any of these bottles, you're probably doing 
bloody well because they're probably you know long long gone and uh, maybe you can pick up the odd one or two at, uh, at auction um or maybe you wouldn't want to after this t uh, this episode of the show who knows let's but let's find out Here I am, taking another step. right okay so let's kick off with the james MacArthur 10 year old let's see what the nose gives us on this then shall we quite soft um fishy briny fresh um salty it's a little bit of a an acetone kind of note it's a bit young there's a little bit of a sort of um mariness to it um a little bit of wood i mean it's pleasant it's okay um it's not going to sort of you know it's not the greatest uh, 10 year old more i think i've ever um Ever, ever tasted in my life but it's certainly certainly pleasant it's quite quite um coastal quite citric um and very briny so it kind of ticks all those boxes it's possibly not as as smoky and as sooty as some bemores there's a there's an element of peat there but it's actually um playing second fiddle to a certain extent to the coastal notes um let's do a part sign That finishes quite well a bit short but really intensely briny really briny really citric not a lot of oak interaction um so the spirit is showing a sort of a quite a youthful edge to it i'm getting that little bit of rose petal as a, a little bit of earthy um coal dust um certainly on the finish again not getting a huge amount of peat it's pretty much more coastal um I think if I tasted that blind, I would probably be, I don't think I would have picked that as a Bamore in actual fact. It really, it doesn't kind of quite have the sootiness, it doesn't quite, it has more coastalness than sootiness, and it kind of feels a little bit, a little bit colliery, um, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was. it's a pleasant 10 year old at the end of the day. Um, no frills, and um, yeah, good start. <laughs> Right, okay, so let's move on to the one and only uh, sherry bottling of the day. So this is the Murray McDavid Mission 14 year old. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? That's actually quite nicely balanced. Um, yes, there's some obvious leafy Oloroso dried fruits, um, but I'm certainly getting brine, earth, fish, quite a bit of medicinal peat as well. Um, little bit of a perfumed edge maybe a little bit of violet um hmm it's really quite a back and forth nose you know you stick your nose in the glass you get a big chunk of sherry you stick your nose back in the glass you kind of get a big chunk of briny citric um medicinal uh isla character it's yeah i think this is a fabulous bottling i mean really very very good definitely entertaining um and like I said, just just perfectly balanced. You know, it's the, the sherry is is augmenting. Uh, it's not blanketing, and you know. So to say that I dislike sherry matured malts is is completely wrong. I like balanced sherry matured uh, malts, um, and this certainly has a lot of balance. It's actually filling out a little bit now, getting a little bit more of that sort of more classic classic sort of maltiness. Um, that I often found with Bamore, or certainly some Bamores anyway. Um, but yeah, that's that's a lovely nose. Let's see what the power sign. that's got a really good progression it kicks off with a lot a lot more of the sherry notes the dried fruit woody tannins um a little bit of coffee as well hickory maybe as well coffee hickory yeah possibly um and then in comes the the, the peat 
the um, the alcohol. The alcohol certainly kind of like almost drives all that sherry away, and you're getting the peat, um, soot. Um, again, a little bit of medicinal peat, more sooty peat, more classical but more peat uh, on this particular one. Um, there's a little bit of a, a coastalness on on the finish. Um, that's right. There's a lot of coastalness on on the finish. It's, I, I feel that salt right in the edges of of, of my palate. Um, I don't think it really needs any water. I mean, because I've left a little bit in the glass, I am going to put a little drop of water with it. Um, but that, the progression of that was just absolutely stunning. Fantastic stuff, it has to be said. Um, okay, a little bit less sherry now on the nose, which I'm guessing is not a surprise because it didn't show a huge amount to start off with. Um, so we're kind of more spirit character, briny, citric, maybe less malty, a little bit fishy, possibly a little bit simpler, maybe. Let's see what the power sign now. It doesn't quite have the progression now. It's kind of almost melded into one. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say homogenous um, because that would be disingenuous to it. It's kind of like, yeah, it's more fuller, it's rounder, it's a little bit sweeter. Maybe the sort of sherry is kind of a little bit more, more noticeable. Um, not quite as sooty, but there is some brininess right on the finish. Um, yeah, I, I, again, I think this is a sort of bottling which you decide how you want to sort of drink it. Um, I think for me personally, I'd prefer it neat. I think it just had a little bit more progression, a little bit more interest. Um, but f for some, the, the alcohol might have been a little bit too intrusive on the palate, and certainly it was noticeable. So, But putting a little drop of water with it, I don't think it's done it any harm at all. Just for me, I think I would I'd go with that one neat personally. <laughs> Right, okay, so let's move on to the 16-year-old old particular bottling. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? There's sort of similarities between this and the James MacArthur bottling in that it's quite fresh and quite citric and herbal, a little bit more mentholated uh, than, um, than the James MacArthur bottling. Um, yeah, so more menthol, camphor, a little bit of dry peat, a little bit of iodine. Um, there's a nice weight of, of, of oak behind that. It's kind of not overtly vanilla -ed. It's kind of sort of there, but not there, if you see what I mean. And, and this is the thing that a lot of people um, kind of miss to a certain extent, is that one of the things that the oak and the tannins do is they give structure to a whiskey. It's kind of like almost kind of having a bit of a scaffold. Uh, to a certain extent um, and in this instance it just shows you sometimes what the oak can do it isn't overtly vanilla it isn't overtly in your face it's sitting back and it's just providing a kind of a base I suppose um, and it's it's a lovely nose um, like I said it's kind of filling out a bit now and it it does share some similarities with the James MacArthur bottling I don't know whether I'd have said 16, it's not really showing its age. Um, and that's one thing I kind of noticed about Bemore is that it doesn't tend to, it, even, even though I've tasted some very, very old Bemores, they don't seem to show the, their age or the wrinkles. Um, <laughs> you know, that's pretty good. Anyway, let's see the pass on. Fresh, mellow, soft. Yeah, it's showing, showing maybe the slightly safer side of Bamor. It's certainly not wild and woolly and and um, and, and coastal. Um, it's got maybe a little bit more barley character. There's not a huge amount of peat. It's subtly peated. It's subtly coastal. The oak is again not really in your face, but it's certainly sort of more noticeable. Um, a little bit of honey possibly as well I mean it's pleasant again it's not I wouldn't have if I tasted that blind I wouldn't have said but more um, and maybe this is it maybe you know it is really quite difficult to pin down the but character so far 
the only one that's kind of been as, as much like the distillery releases is the Murray McDavid, whereas the two, in, the two other bottlings have been a lot more fresher, a lot more, well, to a certain extent, obviously this one has started off a little bit quite fresher, and then the oak kind of... Um, so this is maybe like more like modern Bamor. I mean, this was bottled in 2014, so, yeah, you're probably on the cusp of, of when um, Bamor started to sort of change its, uh, its identity a little bit, and it's possibly more down to the oak. Maybe, although this was a, a refill bourbon hoggy, maybe the distillery was, was starting to use a lot more first fill American oak, or more active uh, refill American oak because certainly the 18 when it replaced the old 17 certainly seemed to have an awful lot more oak character and and that's what made it softer and safer in my personal opinion um but you know either way lovely whiskey um certainly wouldn't uh, wouldn't throw that one um out with the cat oh, what the hell am I saying Right, okay, so let's move on to the first of the two Dura Rattray bottlings. This is the 17-year-old. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Again, really saline. Um, intense, more medicinal peat than, again, dusty peat. Again, some lovely oak. Um, it's, it's kind of similar to the uh, old particular bottling, but there's maybe a little bit more intensity. Um, is it possibly because this is 54% as opposed to being 48? Mm, it's possible. Um, it's got that, again, lovely coastal astringent character. Um, dusty peat, there's sort of an echo of peat. It's not real sort of sooty, sort of hairs on your chest kind of peat. Um, there's a, a, a bit more of a sort of a softness to the peat, but it's got a really lovely astringency to it. Um, that sort of almost medicinal astringency. Hmm, yeah, that's that's a, a good nose. That's really impressive. Uh, I like that. Let's see what pass on. Yep, yeah, that's got some nice progression. It kind of kick, starts off with a fresh saline citric um, character. The oak kind of comes in on the mid palate. Um, and then it kind of comes back to the salinity. Uh, it's not, again, not hugely peated. It's, it's got a very soft peat character, a sootiness to it, um, which, as I keep saying, is, is certainly a sort of an indicator of Bamor to me with that sooty kind of peat character as opposed to the more medicinal kind of peat character, say something like the Freud or the woodiness of Ardbeg or something like that. Um, it always, to me, just said soot and, and coal dust and peat dust and, and this certainly has it. It's maybe not the most complex of, of, of whiskies. I, I've certainly had m more complex palettes. Um, but it has a nice progression, like I said, starting off with, with the sort of citric and um, sort of coastal notes, moving into the oak and finally returning again to the coastal notes. So, you know, overall, it's not a bad bottling at all. Um, so, hmm, yeah. Right, okay, so moving on to the 20-year-old. So, 50.2%. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Oh, well, that's a bit of a different beastie. Um, it's almost kind of meaty, roasted meat and smoke. Um, bog myrtle, rubber. Now, this is certainly, you know, vastly different to the, to the other three. Again, um, fair amount of oaks again, but the oak is kind of sitting back um, uh, and giving some... Um, Possibly a little bit more vanilla character than uh, some of the other bottlings. Um, yeah, that's that's a bit of an odd one, and and it's this is a sort of again this is a sort of bottling that kind of like you know um, plays into the sort of general kind of thought pattern that sort of distilleries sell off casts that don't quite fit their flavour profile. But so far, I would say that these that until we got to this one, these all pretty much did. Um, fit their kind of flavour profile. Um, this one is a bit of, like I say, a bit of an outlier. Um, 
I say quite quite sort of smoke meat, sort of uh, smoke, um, bog myrtle, more herbal, even some iodine notes as well. So this is this is quite sort of quite unusual so, to, to say the least and this is one of the interesting things about doing this I've very rarely do I ever get the opportunity to taste sort of half a dozen different bottlings of the more um, side by side and, and it sometimes can be a, a real eye-opener anyway let's see what that's on Again, quite meaty, but more herbal, more 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 robust. Um, some violets, a little bit of oak. Um, yeah, that meaty sort of coal dust kind of character. Again, it exhibits characteristics that are very more that like I said the dusty peat but then it's got a meatiness that I've never really ever had in a Bamore before. Um, so that's quite unusual. Um, quite oily, um, not as citric on the palate, it's more sort of, like I said, it's more richer, it's fuller, um, the, again, a fair amount of oak, but it's not intrusive, it's all kind of sitting sort of in the background, um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely, definitely different. Just Right, okay, so let's finish off with the extra old particular 25-year-old. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Ooh, ooh yeah, that, that's a gorgeous nose. I mean, and it, it's kind of, it's got a lovely barley character, got a lot of sweet barley. Um, quite, again, medicinal, a little bit of wood, a little bit of kind of like charred wood. Um, Palmer violets, earth, a bit of vanilla, again not a huge amount of oak interaction but enough, um, it certainly shows some maturity but again I wouldn't have put this as a 25 year old, I mean I would have said probably about 18 maybe, um, and it just shows that sort of Bamore just really does not show its age at all. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, you know, I, I never tasted a 50 year old Bamor, but I would, you know, love to do so. And it just, maybe it won't kind of last that much, that long in kind of American oak, who knows. But um, certainly I would imagine it would comfortably go to mid 30s in American oak. Um, and this is just a stunning nose, it really is. It's just, it's gentle, but it's intense, if you see what I mean. It's, it's salty. It's coastal, it's a little bit medicinal, but it's sooty as well. It's just beautifully complex. Um, and I can see why this was bottled in the extra old particular range. I mean, this this wouldn't have been cheap back in, um, when was it, 2015. Um, but my God, is that stunning. Let's see what it passes like. Oh, is that a finish or is that a finish? I mean, that's stunning sort of camphor, violet, midnight violet, um, coffee, dusty tannins, springbank-esque kind of woody tannins on the finish. I mean, that is just stunning. I mean, I'm st I mean, it's just going. It's just going and going. I mean, it's gentle, it's mellow. And I guess this is the thing that, how you can kind of judge a bit more age-wise because the peat is just so so soft it's just like a wisp of, of, of smoke yes there's a little bit of um, tariness um, but it's also delicate but you know it's it's got strength it's got intensity as well still quite coastal lovely saltiness on the aftertaste sweet peat tar a little bit of medicinal, some oak. I mean, that is just incredibly complex. I mean, that is a stunning bottling, it has to be said. Um, 
Yeah, if you ever bought a bottle of that, then, you know, that's, that's, that's a savouring bottle, it has to be said. That's kind of like last dram of the evening kind of bottling. Um, and it is just absolutely stunning. And, you know, it just goes to show... I mean, yes, over the years, there have probably been the, the few, should we say, less than perfect bottlings of, uh, of Bamore. Um, it's no different to any other distillery at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, it just goes to show you that, you know, Bamore produces some bloody good spirit. It's a lovely whiskey. You know, okay, so the distillery bottlings have become a little bit safe nowadays and you don't see the independence anymore, which is a real shame. So, you know, the chances of, of, of you guys kind of like picking up these kind of things now is, is, is well, <laughs> less than zero possibly um so yes you kind of like you've only really got the distillery stuff to sort of uh, you know to sort of fall back on but you know it's it's kind of life it's a bit sad in in, in one respect that you know that the independents don't have the breadth of casks that they they once used to have and it's now sort of a lot of the the lists are becoming very very samey um but you know if you've been in the whiskey industry long enough then you will have you'll have come across these and um yeah mm. right okay so that's some of today's episode of the show firstly a big thank you to uh everybody that uh, all the companies that sort of sent me these samples the ad rattray james MacArthur, um douglas lang and so on and so forth um very much appreciated um the the, the 10 year old um James MacArthur bottling, yeah, it was pleasant. It was straightforward. It was it was kind of okay. Um, there was possibly a reason why that wasn't bottled at cast strength, um, but you know, it was it was all right at the end of the day. It was kind of it set the stall out and said it's quite fishy, quite briny. It was a bit young, possibly. Um, maybe could have done with a little bit more oak interaction but you know it, it wasn't wasn't too shabby and i imagine at the time it wasn't particularly expensive either um the murray mcdavid bottling um now you know i know murray mcdavid were famous for pretty much finishing everything in um x wine casks and all that kind of stuff and there was some really weird stuff that they they bottled back in the day but you know there was some bloody good stuff i mean you know th and this was kind of testament to some of the sort of earlier casks that murray mcdavid had, could get their hands on i mean certainly i remember the, the some of the very first ones that were released which were obviously um the private stock of uh, of the um the owners of the company and maybe you know they never quite got back to you know, some of the quality of, of that maybe uh, but this particular bottle in the mission series i mean i remember the mission series being just absolutely stunning stuff and and you know th this was how to do sherry refill sherry not too intrusive balanced just just bloody good um the Douglas Lang, uh, sixteen-year-old. I mean, it was again pleasant. It was in the sort of like the citric, sort of fresher end of the kind of Bamore kind of spectrum. Maybe lacked some real complexity, um, but overall, I don't think it was a, a particularly bad bottling at all. Um, and the same to a certain extent to the uh, AD Rattray seventeen. I mean, it was it was quite mellow. Uh, it was pleasant. Um, it had some nice medicinal notes. It was, you know, it was okay. It was a pleasant whiskey. I mean, I forget what it retailed for back in 2007, but um, I can imagine it was, you know, relatively well priced, shall we say. Um, and, yeah, overall, not a bad whiskey at all. Um, the 1990, 20-year-old, well, that was kind of, that came out of left field. I mean, that was sort of really unusual, really meaty, uh, really smoky. So, yes, there were elements of, of, of classic Bamore, but then, you know, where did this meatiness come from? You know, it's just not evident in any of the other, uh, other bottlings. And so it just goes to show you how the odd cask or two can really sort of like just go off on a complete and utter tangent. And, I mean... And the, the extra old particular bottling, I mean, yes, bottling of the day, without a shadow of a doubt, not because it's the oldest bottling, because, but because it had the most complexity. It was just a stunning whiskey. And, you know, if Douglas Lang still have casks of that age and that, that quality, um, 
and they're not too expensive although they're probably gonna yeah they probably are gonna be bloody expensive so you know um if you get the, the, the opportunity to sort of maybe try a miniature or something like that you know then then i would do so because that uh, that was absolutely stunning but more so um yeah it's kind of nice to sort of like take a peek at Bemore as it probably once was um and you know without the sort of the polish shall we say because i mean yeah one or two of these were quite polished and one or two of them were kind of maybe more synonymous with the um the current style um the sort of to do rat ray bottlings possibly um and but you know this 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 is the wonderful thing about the the independent sector and why i've always been so interested in it is because it just shows you some you know interesting other sides to the characters of whiskies or distilleries that they just do not show you themselves with their own bottlings and um although i don't think that the current sort of uh, core range from Bemore is, is particularly bad it's just not what it once was at the end of the day so Anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the show. Um, what's basically left to say is good afternoon and good grounding.